Yeah, today my guest uh, is Victor Sherban, um, a technology leader in Berlin. And by the way, that this short story, how I met him, I was actually interviewing him to be my boss uh, at one of the fintechs. <laughs> and back then he did not agree to become my boss. And, uh, you know, years later we're meeting uh, after... A, uh, quite a success story. He uh, he built a great technology company. They recently made an uh, acquisition, but we are here to talk about technology. We're not talking about business, and I you know I might have some other side questions, but mainly the topic is as you know, artificial intelligence, technologies, different frameworks, and technology we use on a daily basis. Uh, Victor, what are you working with? Like, what is your day-to-day -day stack that you basically could uh, come in every room and open every door? Working is so my stack is uh, pretty mainstream. It's React, uh, React Native, AWS. Think that everyone, many people use JavaScript, TypeScript stuff, and um, that's uh, before AI. And since November last year, my stack is ChatGPT a lot, and other AI tools. You know, I must admit that I've I've started to use ChatGPT, and especially with front-end technologies. I I I don't code on a daily basis, but I have to do code reviews or code challenges, and uh, it turn upside down. You know, my my uh, relation to what I'm able to do and what I could put in a, in a few hours. Um, how do you leverage ChatGPT for uh, being an engineer or being engineering leader? So oh, what you mentioned, code review, I think it's amazing for that purpose. It reads code, it can read a lot of code, and it can give you pointers of some smelly code and maybe bugs. I found uh, quite some bugs with that. And sometimes if I have a, like, a lot of code with some crazy logic ifs, whatever, that I don't understand, uh, I just put it into ChatGPT and ask. Yeah, uh, That's a very good use case for ChatGPT. What it's not good is writing enterprise-level code because that's where you know if you have a bigger project, a lot of people working on that project, and you have a lot of conventions in place and a lot of dependencies. You have to know all of that, right? If you onboard a new developer, it will take maybe months or more to fully onboard a new developer on an enterprise project. ChatGPT cannot do that. Not yet. And if we break it down to basically tips and uh, and little uh, suggestions for all the young or uh, developers to be, uh, like how does it actually work? Can I can I copy? I'm going to be asking you stupid questions, which which I already know the answers, but just you know create this uh, acronym of uh, you know technology challenge. If I'm a junior and I come to the project that I have no idea about, let's say like I've taken React Native and I, I need to debug or I got a bug that I need to fix, can I just copy paste uh, the code from uh, from my VS Code into the interface of ChatGPT and ask to find the bug or find the place that uh, represent irregularities in the code? Will this work? Um, quick answer, yes. But you have to consider two things. Uh, one of them uh, is that depends. Uh, I mean, first of all, don't do it before you check your company policy. <laughs> because in bigger companies like Amazon and Google, you are not allowed to do that. Yeah, because of... Why, uh, why, why can't you allow to do this? They, they are afraid that ChatGPT will steal their secrets because people are, you know, people <laughs> and they make mistakes. And sometimes you can copy paste, uh, I don't know, API key or something like that, or some business uh, information into ChatGPT. And ChatGPT is hosted on uh, Microsoft Azure and it belongs to OpenAI. So as a Google, Google employee, you don't want that. Yeah, it's actually forbidden. So hypothetically, if I if I would you know copy paste some internal secrets or I don't know internal API keys that uh, lead to some vulnerabilities in my code, it will yeah. leave a trace on the servers of Microsoft. And hypothetically, if there is going to be like evil force behind with some malicious idea to explore it, they could you know 
you know, have a system to actually scan it through, find traces, and then explore that, right? But th- we're talking about like you know, highly hypothetical environment, or th- th- does it even happen? Like, do you believe in these conspiracies? Not really. Uh, myself, I'm using it all the time, but. You have to take into account that, yeah, basically, if you have default uh, settings in ChatGPT, that it will save your uh, chat history. That means everything that you, yeah, and if someone can hack them and stuff like that. You know, in Google and Amazon, they use internal tools for everything, for code hosting. Yeah, they don't use GitHub. Yeah, they, they build internal tools for everything. They are quite paranoid. Yeah. So if someone hacks OpenAI and finds your chat history, then that's not too cool. But... Uh, in OpenAI uh, agreement that you that you basically agree to by, by using ChatGPT, there is uh, this clause that says if you disable chat history, then they are not saving everything from your chats. Uh, as a matter of fact, in in the company where I work right now, we um, we actually even. <laughs> enforce everyone using ChatGPT. I believe it's a good policy mm. to make to make yeah. people smarter. However, we provide like this corporate account with a disabled disabled function that you just mentioned. Yeah. But I'm able to trace because we use one 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 account for for many engineers, you you able to still see the, the you know the different chats, the different traces, although it it, it doesn't save from mm. the in the background, but I could I could clearly see what people are prompting, so I could read the history well, of prom- prompts. <laughs> that that yeah, exactly. That should stay because that's the whole idea of ChatGPT that you have a conversation. So as long as you are in that conversation, it should stay somewhere, right? So that's why I think they keep it for for a short time. Yeah. Another problem with that idea you, uh, is uh, the context length. That's the fundamental limitation of any large language model today. And for the web interface of ChatGPT, I believe it's about 4,000 tokens, maybe added 8,000. That's not really a lot. 8,000 token, tokens means around 5,000 words, more or less. Yeah. So you can copy paste uh, one, two classes of your code one two files uh, of your code uh, into chat gpt and for a big enterprise application that's not enough to give chat gpt the, the good idea of what's going on in that regard i think copilot is doing a better job because copilot is is made of two parts yeah one is like general generally trained network and second one is this thing they call it codex or something the one that takes all your code from your GitHub and fine tunes it to to your style, to your enterprise style. It doesn't mean that it has read all your code and remembers it. That is not true. It kind of styles the suggestion similar to your code style. And now that we you mentioned uh, Copilot, which is, by the way, also developed by the same company that released ChatGPT, am I correct? Yes. So yes, there, it is. there are also there is a Bard, there is Llama, there is uh, uh, Cloud uh, too, there is Midjourney, uh, Dal E. Uh, so, um, what have you able to to play with, and what? What also leave a mark on you, like with this wow, after you've tested mm-hmm. this for the first time? Well, uh, all all of them. <laughs> you know this joke about Chuck Norris. How many push up, push ups Chuck Norris can do? You know? Uh, no. All of them. <laughs> 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 so uh, yeah, I tried all of them. No, the most popular and uh, GPT four today is unbeatable it's just the best for sure but even via api the longest uh, version with the longest context you can get is 16k today i believe and with cloud you can get a model that has 100k token uh, tokens uh, context length that means like simply let, let let's just break down the idea of uh, context here. You have you're having a chat with a uh, chat GPT, a long chat about something, and then at some point you realize that we just talk about it, may or maybe yesterday we talked about it. That was at the beginning of our chat, and it doesn't remember anymore. It only remembers the last four thousand. 
Yeah, if you're gonna paste the whole book into ChatGPT, it's not possible via, via web interface. You can paste it via API, but it will only remember the last four thousand or eight thousand tokens. So basically, the way I I like to explain it, ChatGPT is like very um very smart. And it's like a person who read a lot of books and basically literally read the whole internet, yeah? But that person is like, it's like you wake that person up in the middle of night <laughs> and you ask a quick question. So the person doesn't really have context about anything, yeah? He, he, the chat GPT has all its intelligence and it remembers a few previous messages in a chat, but that's it. You cannot feed it. Uh, one friend of mine, had this concern, you know, if we start posting to ChatGPT our code and our internal knowledge things, then at some point ChatGPT will just will know everything about our company. That is not true. It's not able to do that. It will know the last four thousand within one chat, and that's a really big limitation. And with cloud, you can literally with one hundred k context lens, you can literally paste a book, the whole book a mid-sized book and ask it to summarize it for you or maybe ask a particular question about some, some characters in a book. So that was pretty good. Yeah, there are um, um, there are companies that uh, business model of their, those companies based for summarizing book, books and selling them online. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, there, there's yeah. one company called Blinkist that I, I just met founder yeah. recently and uh, they have an army of people they call them uh, uh, bookworms and this is what they do <laughs> they, they, they actually you know reading books for, for a living yeah. and they're getting paid to summarize them so yeah. so theoretically the you know they are on the edge of losing the business to to one of the basically tools uh, that you know is able to basically you know uh, combine the the book in one uh, summary, which you could also write in the form or language of specific author. Yeah. And 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 and, and theoretically, I, you know, I love this. And by the way, I've I've I asked you before who is your one of your favorite podcaster. You also mentioned Lex Friedman, yeah. uh, who, whom I, I I love to follow and listen every podcast of his. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think he recently invited someone. I, I don't remember who it was. It was the, it was it was probably um, Andreessen Horowitz that, who mentioned that ChatGPT is actually killing the, the white collar workers, and still yeah. is not able to replace the blue collared workers because yeah. you know, it's too cheap to replace them. Therefore, they would you know their they, they their prices and wages will. Will be higher. However, all these intelligent professions, like I don't know, copywriters or somebody who would summarize books, they would be out of business because any large language model would make it thousand uh, times cheaper and I don't know, million times faster. And I, well, you know, you and me, we we actually also we represent this um, white collared workers. Although sometimes I, I apply my the joke that I'm I'm working on the the robot Galera. And and basically, you know, like I'm probably, like, you know, also like a blue, blue colored worker. Do, do, do you believe we're going to be out of job pretty soon? No, not really. I mean, at least not today. I, I agree. When, I agree when, with when, you, when, Victor. When, <laughs> when, 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 when are we going to be out of job? <laughs> well, look, I think you and me, our generation is still okay. <laughs> I'm worried about about my children. <laughs> Your daughter is, I think, a few years older than my daughter. Uh, and, and, and my daughter comes to me with uh, questions. Oh, you know, like, I actually don't know what to do. Where do I supposed to work? Like this and that. And I have very hard time formulating my thoughts to put her in direction. So I'm saying, like, you know, it doesn't matter. I'm saying you, you need to become curious. You need to develop a passion. And you need to develop way of learning things. That's it. The rest basically will come organically. You don't have influence on that because the technology landscape will change in a couple of years uh, that we're not going to be able to recognize it. What is your views on that? 
Well, look, we've been there with a JavaScript framework popping up every two years. You know, <laughs> it makes no sense to, sense to learn one of them and call yourself a professional. You should be able to learn. And um, I think g general skills like uh, organization, uh, communication, uh, being able to learn things like that. And you don't have to be better than future GPT-8 or whatever, right? You just have to be better than most people. And if a concept of job will still remain in 20, 30 years, then, you know, the most talented people will uh, get a job. So you don't have to beat GPT-8. You only have to beat most of your fellow uh, humans. But wouldn't it be a lonely world where you beat your fellows and they envy that you're actually able to have a job and the rest is basically living on unconditional income? I, I think it's going to be kind of a said world i don't know like i'm just i'm just curious to explore that and and, and probably we're not gonna or maybe we will see this already in our in our lifetime let me make a comment on that i mean we are having fun and making predictions here but i've i've seen a chart recently where it's it was something like a landscape of ai today of ai tools that people are using today 60% of that is ChatGPT. One product. And after ChatGPT, how many really breakthrough products, how many breakthrough products have you seen? Yeah, we have a journey and we have ChatGPT. What else? Well, the I've recently been to a Google conference where they were pushing BART really hard and they were saying that it's going to be like a corporate, corporate style ChatGPT because it does one thing uh, better than ChatGPT. It uh, enables, uh, uh, it's not called predictability, basically the, the, you, you're able to validate why, so you could always go back to the source of the answer and say, why have you, wh why have you said that? And they could kind of like, you know, ex ex explainability like they, they have behind. The open AI doesn't have that explainability. They, they, they're not able to explain it why. So they know, they predict the new word as probability token, but nothing else. And uh, so. But that's what BART does. That's what BART does. And, and I, that's I believe... exactly how, they, how it works. And I, I kind of suspect, I've seen it. Yeah, you know, if you talk to BART, it says, gives references and explain, can explain why you. Uh, it might be a hack because uh, large language models are still a black box, right? You don't really know why that token popped up. And they only predict the next token. That's all they do. And you don't really know why they did it. So you can ask GPT to explain, and it will provide a reasonable explanation. I'm not sure if they made a huge breakthrough like that, that Bard can really retrospectively look into its... Uh, uh, into its uh, neural structure and say, say, yeah, this this answer popped up because I read this article three years ago. That you know, we we would be talking about G Google would publish a paper about that, and we will be talking about it all of us. Yeah, I haven't heard about that such breakthrough. I'm thinking maybe they have a hack that they provide a reasonable re explanation, which is not always why that answer can, came up. Well, you know, one thing is uh, certain that uh, we are uh, right at the edge of this rapid development. What's going to happen is probably would be very hard to, to answer. The same thing as we were answering 10 years ago when the whole, uh, let's say, JavaScript ecosystem was developing. Nobody would was oh, believing yeah. that it's going to take the world so rapidly. And... Um, uh, well, you've mentioned that you are heavy in using uh, TypeScript, JavaScript, uh, React, React Native. There is also this uh, new uh, a Bun framework that's supposed to replace uh, Node.js oh, and yeah. make it make it hundred, uh, not hundred, like three times faster. They claim. Yeah. And you know, there is always this uh, question: if this is so popular and everybody know yeah. knows JavaScript. Uh, why do you even? Why do we even like you know uh, 
explore different technology why why don't we make the world <laughs> javascript native well like you know we have a react native but make it like a school program everybody would be learning javascript at school uh use it like on every interface uh, having node.js on the back end would that be a good world for for the future i think there is uh, empiric law that says that everything that can be written programmatically in any language will be written in javascript sooner or later <laughs> so i think it's already happening but um let, let me give another perspective on that so i actually like the the question uh, from you about um what tech stack will remain and what will fade out it kind of goes into the same direction so if you think about it right now like i'm writing code and i'm using copilot already for two years since the day one i'm using chat gpt from the day one i'm combining the two tools and um, if you think about it why is chat gpt so good with javascript because it read a lot of javascript code like literally a huge part of the internet is javascript code yeah how about go how big part of the internet, how big is the training data for ChatGPT written in Go? It's not so huge. How about some some st stuff like Scala or something less popular? Yeah. So popular language, what I'm what I say that popular languages, they already have the huge edge because they are popular and every newcomer is starting to learn them. But now ChatGPT and Copilot gives it even a bigger edge because ChatGPT is simply better in JavaScript than in Scala. Well, let me challenge you here because uh, do you think if if Scala would be uh, front end heavy that you know the that every browser see the source code of Scala, the probably the competition would be equal because the amount of training data would be also similar because JavaScript is a browser language that is like basically accessible on every product on every site. And for any backend, you need to have access to a code base. Otherwise, you know, it's very hard to, tra to, to, to train the data. So it's probably basically amount of, amount of data trained with JavaScript is a lot heavier. Maybe in the future where the repositories will become openly available, then the this equality will be uh, different. Well, I think the, the way I see it is the most uh, training data came from open source repositories. So if you go to GitHub and simply uh, sort it by languages, you will find JavaScript on top and then Python, and then TypeScript, and stuff like that, yeah? So simply the amount of code that you can get, you, you can get your hands on as a AI, uh, you know, trainer, JavaScript sim simply is on top. And that makes, uh, it makes GPT smart in, in that language. And that's, uh, l let me give you an opposite example. There is Swift. Uh, yeah, I, I was an iOS developer. I was using Objective C and then Swift, and Swift is pretty cool in terms of it's really new. So they and it's changing all the time. So every year they release a new version of Swift, and they also release a migration tool. So you take your Swift code and you migrate it to the next version every year. And ChatGPT, I think the last uh, data it knows about is January twenty two. So. If you want to write modern Swift code today, you cannot with ChatGPT because it only remembers the previous versions. Yeah. By the way, I just pulled the the chart. I want to I want to share it with with uh, with. Uh, let me see. I've never actually seen this uh, sharing screen, but I will I will try. So uh, entire screen, and I'm gonna just. Uh, uh, Chrome tab. There is this stats uh, by GitHub about mm -hmm. language popularity, but this is um, it's not it's not for the specifically open source, but overall. And mm -hmm. I we could see I don't know if I, if I if I could see like this the amount of pull requests for specific uh, code. Python is number one, and we yeah, have. That's... Pull requests, right? Yeah. So if we look at, uh, I don't know, 
you could always you could only look at repository mm. level basically how active mm. specific repository is because you you measure amount of pull request stars pushes or, or issues yeah i see uh, I the one i've seen is was was simply a number of repositories in a certain language all right then uh, but uh, yeah yeah i also remember that you know by by number of repos and I would believe that JavaScript is still going to be number one. It's vastly dominated pretty much because simply you, you start with JavaScript. There is nothing else you could you could progress with without knowing some basics in JavaScript. Or Python, also pretty cool and very popular, easy to start. Yeah, yeah, but not not in the front end, uh, you know, front end applications. Like you, sure. you, you can go I without mean... that. Nothing is, uh, I mean, not everything is about front end, right? If you are working in ML field, uh, you don't even have a front end. Absolutely. But, you know, we progress in our, like, you know, every developer progress with, like, you know, basics. It's like a, a, in, 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 in the math class, you, you, you start learning arithmetics and then you go to the geometry and everything else, like, and algorithms. <laughs> with engineering, probably, the most obvious path would start with like you know basic uh, foundation. You learn uh, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and then you would you know your next course is going to be on something, uh, the backend yeah. or machine learning or any, anything else. However, I don't know. I haven't been to these code classes right now. Probably everything changed since then. <laughs> you know, let's let's just uh, touch uh, upon things that make you a great engineer outside of your uh, engineering realm. You're doing sport. You're doing what kind of sport you do? I climb, so bouldering, climbing, that stuff. How did you? How do you develop that passion? Does it basically just uh, historically or? Uh, kind of, it just happened. Um, once I think it was like seven years ago or eight years ago, we were uh, gonna go on a hiking trip with my wife and some friends and then my wife found a job and she was like okay i'm not i'm not going and then everything just uh, collapsed and no uh, like it was the total chaos we didn't have a team anymore and uh, one friend of mine uh, told me okay so you already have a vacation that day so come with us to spain and we will do we will be doing climbing i'm like what what is climbing let's let's go let's give it a try so i was given at this the um uh, belay device and uh, I was told to just belay a person which now I realize was not safe at all because that's not how we do it with a, with a total uh, newbie <laughs> belaying someone but back then that's how I started and it was a really nice area in Spain uh, Rodeyar in the middle of Spain it's like a huge canyon and there is a tiny village mostly mostly just serving climbers <laughs> who come to climb there and there is this canyon like uh, 50 meters uh, tall and there is a river in the middle of it so beautiful area and all people climb and i just really dig it i i got hooked right away i came back i bought myself a belay device <laughs> i went to a climbing gym here in berlin we don't have any mountains but we have a few really decent climbing gyms and we have a few bouldering gyms where you can climb without without a rope and yeah i just got hooked after that i was always into sports a little bit i mean like to jog and stuff like that uh but i never had my passion i was always like okay i have to make myself to exercise yeah to stay fit and with climbing it's just not like that it's with climbing if i don't climb for a couple of days i'm like okay something's wrong i have to go and climb <laughs> Interesting. Uh, most of the great idea come to people while they move. It's been proven that, uh, you know, people were walking or running or swimming and then uh, yeah. they, they've been struck by ideas. Does it happen to you while you do climbing or that sports require you 100% attention that you can't think of anything else? Kind of really concentrated on it because climbing it's not uh, not endure, not an endurance sport or not repetitive sport like jogging. Yeah. With jogging, I think it might easy, easy be a, a case, right? When you jog and you think about something and ideas come to your mind. But in climbing, it's like a problem solving, especially in uh, bouldering. If you have a route, so you come to bouldering gym and you have these different colored uh, hangers that you just grab. 
and your task is to solve it. So you uh, you start at your level, you find something that is challenging enough for you, something that you cannot do at the first uh, run. And you just look at it, you maybe look how different people do it, you get an idea because you know the it's not like moves are predefined. It's not like climbing a ladder. It's completely different. You have to find moves. So it's a lot like gymnastics. And you have to find the right moves. So it's also challenging for your mind. That's why I like it. So it is similar to coding because like you know, you could you could yeah. solve a different problem in a in a in a many different ways. Yeah, it's but, like lead code. <laughs> and but you know, like uh, I, I I remember uh, you were telling me about uh, the the trips you did uh, somewhere in the south. It was either Italy or or somewhere in the south, where you actually it's kind of like a hiking because like we we go with the friends hiking. We go to Finland. We go to like some places where you spend a lot of day hiking, and then you sleep in the mountains. You did something similar. But it's actually semi semi hiking, semi climbing. What is it called? Like, how does it look like? I think it's like something um, roots, whatever. Like you, you had to go and you had to climb to these metal things. Like, uh, yeah. Well, no, it's not like hiking. So hiking is really the approach. Actually, I started with hiking. I went uh, back to Crimea uh, in two thousand as a student and I was uh, staying in a tent with a uh, huge backpacks, like 30 kilos. I did all, all that stuff. And then I discovered uh, climbing and alpinism. So yeah, you, you can say that alpinism is kind of like that. If you go higher to like three, four thousands, and that's where you start to get glacier. Yeah. Even in the summer, that's what I did uh, this year in August. <laughs> I just went to 3000 and uh, we had half a meter of snow. That was a lot of fun. And uh, that's not hiking anymore because, you know, you have a glacier, you have crevasses, so you have to wear crampons, you have your ice axe, you have to tie in into a role party with your friends because, you know, if someone falls into a crevasse, the rope uh, team is supposed to save you. So that's a different sport. It's not hiking anymore. That's a very dangerous hiking, I would say. <laughs> How important is team? Uh or then the team spirit in the mountains, like in this kind of like, you know, hardcore trips that you just mentioned. Yeah, I like the German word for that, Seilschaft. Yeah, it's like you're a team with, uh, who's in one rope. And it's uh, extremely important, yeah. Uh, it's basically you, if you tie in in the same rope with some people, you trust your life uh, with, uh, with them. And they do the same because you can fall or they can fall and the, the everyone else will just catch a fall. That's that's what you do. And uh, it's really important. The way, the way I like to uh, compare it uh, is a co-founder's relationships in startup. It's like a Zeilschaft. Well, I've seen many teams where co-founders don't talk to each other. <laughs> 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 uh, but, but you know, like interesting. I, I recently watched uh, an interview from Steve Jobs when he was a uh, uh, he was already like a famous. He released all these like you know great products, and there was a question like, "What product are you most uh, proud of?" And he's like, "None. I'm proud of the team that I've built, and the teams yeah. were able to build products." And I remember when I was uh, when I met you, and I want you to be my boss back back in the the, the company like it was three years ago. Um, like I say, like how would you describe yourself in and and in one sentence? And I remember it struck my mind back then. You say, look, I'm I'm a really like I'm a I'm a CTO. Or I'm an engineer uh, with whom other engineers love to work. Like I, I just I remember I remember that. And and now with you know with all these stories that like all these like you know camps in and in and in mountains where you brought, when you need this. Zeilschaft, or like I don't even know how to translate it, like rope camaraderie. Uh, and how how to how, how would you recommend, or what is your recipe for building successful engineering team where people could trust each other, they could like watch each other back, where code review is considered to be a praise and not a criticism. So anything that makes a great engineering team. Have you watched Ted Lasso? No. On Apple, it's about a football team 
very nice uh, TV show, and I think it's about just about that. Yeah, it's about building a team where everyone can trust each other, and yeah, the, where you can re- rely on your peers. Um, I can give you an example of a team that that impressed me a lot. Uh, currently, I'm uh, part of a volunteering organization, a tiny one. We have less than 10 people, and we basically operate a chatbot where we help refugees. Uh, if someone comes, uh, basically we started for to help Ukrainian refugees. If someone what, comes what is, to Germany... What is it called? It's called Ask Schmidt. Schmidt Ask as in German name, Ask, Ask Schmidt. Schmidt. Not very. Some refugees wouldn't be able to even pronounce Schmidt. And also, like, ma- <laughs> just just making joke because, like, you know, in the East European world, Schmidt is not always like the ni- the nicest names to have. Like, like, who is Schmidt? Like, it's like ah, some some German guy. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I think it's an old German name, and where it came from, one of our founders has a dog named Schmidt. So that's uh, the dog is our mascot, and. Yeah, let me use this chance to just uh, um, advertise it a little bit. So if you are a refugee or you know refugees who come to Germany and who have no idea what's going on, all the bureaucracy and German style of, you know, you have to write letters and use snail mm-hmm. mail. <laughs> That's crazy. And uh, if you have questions, just, uh, you know, ask Schmidt. And there is a group of volunteers who's helping. And back to the point about building teams. That is one of the most amazing teams I worked with. And the if you think about it, it's a team that is doing something, get, getting together and doing something, uh, doing some project, some uh, product, whatever, together and not uh, not getting paid for it. And everyone is doing it because they want to do it. So I think that's the key, the secret ingredient. You have to of course, you have to pay people, right? I'm not saying <laughs> use volunteers. Yeah, we, you have to pay uh, people. But I think there should be a really good filter and you really should find people who who wants to do this project or this product, who wants to be in this team for real, for whatever reason. Right? Victor, if I break it down to several components, uh... Because I could, I could imagine the idea or the purpose could play a huge role in this project. Probably, basically, a belief that you're doing something good. It's yeah. uh, it's it, it could be kind of coming from ideology, like you know, you previously historically, I believe that people were building churches, huge constructions. Some of them were not yeah. were not being paid because they had a idea, belief in something, right? But uh, in a commercial world, if we if we consider engineering as a basically a religious a religious project, and I don't know some people are driven by that, some not, but there has to be something else beyond uh, an idea or beyond the purpose. What else in this particular team, ask Schmidt, could you uh, describe that actually make you stick together? It's pretty clear in this particular team. So there is Ukrainian refugees who come to Germany and who need help. And uh, not not even all of us speak Ukrainian. So we use, uh, there are some Germans who understand German bureaucracy and they use automatic translation. And there are people who want to help. And we do. We just happen to gather up and uh, do it. But somebody, I, I, but this is again, this is my assumption, somebody or something must stick you together like do you believe in like hidden leadership probably and i would assume i don't know i don't know any of you i only know you in the team but i believe that somebody in the team is this mother or father that actually holds up the whole family we have a founder i think that's like huge respect to him uh, who um, the whole initiative started uh, when the war started and people were just going to the border here from Germany and picking up refugees from the border because there was no instru- infrastructure back then in the f- first uh, two weeks of the war. Later, I came to the border and I've seen like a huge uh, mall and there there was like uh, foldable beds and food and everything was in place and heating. Right, but that was later, a couple of months later. And when the whole thing started, it was a total chaos. People would just cross the border, and 
you know, where do they go? So German, my, my, my friend Tilman and other mostly German people started to simply rent a bus and go to the border to pick us, pick up some people. And that's how, that's how the community started. And then at some point when we, uh, so I was not part of the organization back then, but the guys, they realized, okay, now the transportation problem is solved. Infrastructure is there. We are not helping there anymore, but we are it's like a super cool community right now. What else can we do to help? And they did the survey and they realized, okay, we can actually provide information, informational support yeah we can answer questions to people who just arrived and have no idea what's going on uh yeah and but the idea is basically that you can spend two or may maybe three hours per week not it's not a huge effort you can be anywhere in any country right but if you're able to open a chat and help someone and even using uh, auto translation it's super easy to do but back to your question yeah it started as a community of really awesome people and there was some leadership, yeah. At some point, uh, my friend took over. Sorry about that noise. <laughs> That's my dog. Uh, my friend Tilman took uh, took kind of took over and uh, uh, basically he's moderating our meetings uh, once a week, and we are just staying together and uh, doing it. I think leadership is definitely a part of this. Uh, I, I, is is your dog is your dog named Schmidt? <laughs> no, let let me out. Let him out. <laughs> okay, salt. <laughs> yeah, I have a, I, I, I have I have a cat, and I have the same problem. But the problem is that my cat comes at night when I'm sleeping, and he wants to go out, and he starts like <laughs> meow meow. And but like you know like uh, what I would love to exercise with you. Imagine you and me. We're starting like a, a, a startup. We don't have money. We don't have money to pay. But it's not, having our experience, we know that there has to be like a really strong purpose. We need to. Uh, convey idea and the idea must be uh, so powerful to enlighten people that people want to join our startup it wouldn't be enough we, st we still need also leadership and the leadership is actually what you and me as a founder need to provide these people of assurance people of like feeling of structure feel feeling of i don't know what what actually engineering leader needs to provide for other engineers to want to to join that that startup yeah if, if you look if you look back and all the teams and all engineers you're working with what do you think it, it it is like from from us from like engineering leaders what what kind of hats do we need to wear or i don't know what what energy we need to project to attract people it's a very good question a uh, long time ago uh I've heard someone saying, like, it's a, it's like a thought experiment. Yeah. As a founder, what can you outsource of your, in your job? Like developing, writing code, you can outsource that. Bookkeeping, bookkeeping, you can outsource. Yeah. Cleaning your office. What one thing you cannot outsource? Energy, that energy that I provide. I that's probably something that I'm not going to be able to outsource. The core the core value of the business or service I would not going to be able to outsource. Well, I would even consider that a lot of time depends on the idea. Uh, if if for us engineering is a salt and and brat, we wouldn't be outsourcing engineering from the beginning would be also a, a, a mistake because. That, that's how you translate your idea into code and this becomes your product. So the core product I wouldn't be able to outsource. And uh, it's not my idea. I just really like it. So, and so I can tell you what was the answer uh, back then. And it was hiring, hiring new people. You should never outsource because that's where you choose people. And I think what I really like what you mentioned as energy, and I think that's kind of it goes into direction of culture, engineering culture and organization culture. And I think it starts with people 
because the first people who uh, like first founders they have personality energy right and then other people join you hire uh, new people and you should hire like-minded people right if you want uh, yourself and your team to be happy it should be like-minded people and that that's where it all starts and then you know it evolves the the initial culture the initial energy that you put into it it evolves into an organization with a certain values like minded but not but not like looking oh, of course complementary uh, skills yes you know uh, l l l let me leverage you for an advisor you know i um I struggle with uh, so uh, our recruiter provides like a, a tons of uh, applications, and I have to I have to take a decision whom to hire. And we we've, we've been so so busy recently, and uh, the pipeline of potential candidates was growing and growing until the point that my recruiter just came and was like, "Hey, we cannot hold people in a in a pipeline so long. You need to you need to look at their code reviews, and we provide coding challenges so that people do." Code challenges, and they send send some codes in form of uh, GitHub link, and I and I have to basically pull it up and, and test it, and it takes some time. But I was like running out of time, so what I did, I did like this. I I leveraged ChatGPT. ChatGPT helped mm -hmm. me a lot, and I like to show me the the test structure, etc. And I did like five code reviews at once, like I did one after one after one, like yeah. like 10, 10 minutes each. After one hour, I was done. I was so happy for five yeah. code, code reviews, like the, the week of work <laughs> is done. But then I, it was still very hard for me to take a decision who I like or I don't like because everyone did the code challenge in a way that it, it solves the problem. Uh, but what I found myself being guilty I started to look at the easy way of uh, looking at code challenge. So some people, I had to, I had to go in a GitHub and I had to clone the repository and then basically put it in the folder and start the, mm. the npm, etc. The other ones did it a slightly easier. They've, they've, they, they hosted somewhere, so there was a link, mm. so I could only click a link, and I, I could constantly see the instantly see the code challenge. Is that a so like I'm a, I'm I'm a lazy I'm a lazy seat like the the leader so basically I own I've I've picked two candidates out of five who who did this extra mile and provided me easy way to yeah. to validate their code challenge. So m my question: Am I am I doing this wrong? Like because I'm I'm at the end I'm a human being and I I want to save my time and I I've picked like e easy way to. To, to, to test my uh, code challenges. How would you do, do, do that? Like, or what, what tips would you give me? What shall I do basically to not to miss a good candidate or, or, it, or you think it's okay? Um, first of all, I usually don't, don't even make the decision myself. I usually ask uh, some uh, like uh, lead, lead developers, uh, team leads to look at the code. Uh, because I don't trust my uh, my own <laughs> review on that level, and in the end of the day, it's not me writing code with them on daily basis. Yeah, it's my developers, right? So they should like the code of that person. That's how I uh, look at that. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm pretty sure that you're not lazy at work. I, I have an idea that you're a beast at work and do a lot of stuff so i think maybe in your head this is not the topest priority you know to to give to dedicate your time to to hiring uh, the right person and it's not necessarily hiring the right person making an offer to the right person of course you do your best to do that but you know you have the um, probation period uh, and uh, that's also part of hiring yeah I really like that phrase I've heard uh, in some some time ago. If there is a doubt, then there is no doubts. Meaning, if you're not sure about this candidate, then that's not the right candidate. But if you have five candidates, and you all good, well, you 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 <laughs> kind of like you know you uh, <laughs> like you know like let me challenge yet another. Uh, um, 
a common belief that I actually have been guilty practicing. And uh, a lot of people saying, no, this is no good. Because like in in all the books about startups, we read uh, fire fast, hire slow. So basically, yeah. if, there, if there is doubt, if there is basically somebody get off the rails and then it creates this feeling of toxicity in a team, in order not to drag the team down, it's, be, it's, it's better to basically make a decision fast. But yeah. higher slow is basically, you know, validated as long as you can until you basically, if I just still uh, manning your thoughts, don't have any doubts. And I've been... Uh, doing something opposite, I was I was hiring very fast, with the with the idea to validate people in the trade, because you have mm-hmm. this six months in Germany, mm-hmm. when we have a pro 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 side and and the, the, you know the the whole hiring process, people are stressed and sometimes it's very you 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 can't really see them, you know th- their real personality and performance and ability to solve tasks. Yeah. So my only way to get them to to spread their wings and, and 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 strive is actually put them in a put them in the in the battlefield. So I, I I tend to hire really fast and I like to hire f- very fast and, and then fire as well very fast if it doesn't work. How, how do you do do that? Uh, but wait, I'm curious. It, that, does it work for you? I I, I don't have a reputation of uh, the one. Who let who let go many people? So probably it worked. Okay. So probably <laughs> ability. Well, if you allow them to to quickly jump right on the board, and I, I actually I've been guilty to bringing people on the first day during the hackathons because in, in the companies we like in some companies like some companies have research and development days or hackathons, and I like to onboard them during the hackathon, <laughs> and I sit with them and we try to look at the small challenge. To kind of establish this bar high up that you know you could on board take several weeks to learn the code, but or you could treat this as a hackathon, you know, yeah. uh, see what you have, what you know, and apply your ability to solve a problem with the with you know company context. So it 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 proved to work pretty good, but again, like you know, I'm I'm one of the hundreds that you know have their their style so i would love to challenge how you do this and like to, so maybe we would at the end find like this middle ground in the middle that should work for everyone um so i would prefer my approach would be to hire slow yeah to maybe have more elaborate uh, hiring process with many uh, stages uh, you know, at some point in my life, I was interviewing uh, for Amazon, and I went through all the circles of hell <laughs> of their interviews, and I learned a lot about that process. So I think that made me a better CTO at the end, because um, basically the, the all big tech, Google, Amazon, Netflix, and so on, they have very a very similar uh, approach to hiring. And... Uh, it must be working if they have this approach. And I've seen it working. I myself, going through that process, I was really, really impressed. Because, of course, at the end, they like, you cannot make your decision and know a person for sure, know that it's a good fit. But they get as close to that as possible. And what they do with that, um, they don't, actually, they don't give you the, the coding challenges that you do at home. That they don't really do it. They do like a coding interview where you code on on a, on a box. Um, but the, what they do a lot, and they uh, really apply that to engineers as well, not only managers. They do these behavioral interviews where they ask you. Basically, that's where you tell anecdotes. They always started with "Tell me about a time when you disagreed with your team." Mm-hmm. So, h- how do you answer that? Right, like, like. <laughs> said so, like the team was wrong and I was right and you know I I, I made them I convinced them like <laughs> that's not the right answer right and um, I think there are so it's kind of like a framework how to interview people and it's I think it's a really good one I'm happy that I learned it I, I'm using it now in my interviews 
unfortunately, when I hire people, I'm not Google or Amazon, right? And I don't have it like a hundred of developers waiting for one <laughs> open position. <laughs> I don't have that huge line. I, I cannot make a uh, candidate spend so much time with me. Uh, on the interview, but uh, using elements from that, I think that really helps to at least minimize the chance of hiring the wrong person. Yeah, I'm kind of I'm kind of tiered uh, <laughs> or split because I, I've I've been doing similar thing. I went I went through I, I think this uh, seven hells of Amazon. At least uh, for the oh. position I was applying, I had to go through seven steps, and I think on, I failed on fifth. Uh, and I I couldn't get I couldn't get this like I couldn't. So what I understood is basically it was about uh, them having doubts. So probably they have the same mentality. If you have doubts that this person could succeed in that role, you should mention, okay, I have a doubts, and then basically that's over. But I wasn't, like, in in contrast to you, I haven't learned a lot from, 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 from that interview. Um, what I particularly like, looking back in, 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 in my career, mm -hmm. was um, ability to test if you think outside of the box but again this is depends on the position you apply there was a there was a moment i was applying for a for a one uh, a bank a digital bank and they they show me a test that was basically calculation of uh currency exchange and uh and the the, the question okay you need to write an algorithm but the behind the scene, you don't have to write an algorithm. It was like a math math uh, test that, that you, our kids do. You need ah. to you need to write a simple proportion. If this change that, then it's basically automatically the the, the numbers change. And and I did that, and say and uh, uh, the feedback that I got, like you know, actually not nine out of ten people, instead of actually thinking how to solve that without coding. They, so nine, nine, nine people in, uh, out of 10 will start coding this. They will start <laughs> creating an algorithm. And this instantly tells them, okay, people don't think out of, outside of the box. And this is what I like. But mm. again, there, there, there is probably no right and wrong for, for every company. And, you know, there is existing culture that scout for specific traits and, and personalities. And I'm curious, like, if you join... Google or Amazon or Meta or uh, OpenAI, what would be your company to go? I'm not sure if I want to join a huge company like that. If uh, you would have joined them at the beginning, imagine this is a startup, like you, you have a, vi a vision and the ability to join them years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. From what I've heard, I have some friends who work at Google and Amazon and worked at Facebook, so I did some interviews. And from what I've heard, I think Google might be the one. Uh, I've heard that they have a really good engineering culture and they really make decisions. Um, what, what I always liked about product teams is the idea that every developer is involved in the product decisions. And to achieve that, there should be like really good transparency and there should be information uh, flowing about customers, about your users, about the hypothesis you are testing anything, right? Or ideally, it all is happening on the development level. Right, so you have a team that's building this product, and there is nobody else but this team. Right, there is no five levels of management, and then users. So, I think that's why. I think what I've heard is that developers are uh, engineers are really involved into building products at Google, and that I really like. So what you're saying that um, for you, 
or basically the company that you believe has a great culture, a great engineering culture, yeah. is the is the one who empowers engineer to build their product very close to the uh, the users, or basically to, to to build the product directly without these layers of management that translates and uh, you know writes tickets, but. Yeah, but we all we all want this, right? Like we all strive yeah. for this. This is the all. Yeah. This is every company challenge: how to in, how to empower engineers to take decisions and dictate, or basically be a good sparring partner for product people. Like I've never yeah. seen other companies, well, not not in the startup world, that wouldn't have that concept. It's like we we all strive for that, but only few yeah. men manage to build this. So, like I'm, I'm just thinking. <laughs> I can just say that I myself solved it, right? Like I, I, I really work hard in every team I'm working at. I really work hard to, to achieve that, and I always push that kind of mentality. You know, it's like uh, you know why I became an engineer. Uh, back in school, I was writing code in Pascal back then, or Visual Basic stuff like that. And what I always loved is that you create. Things. You feel like a creator. You create things out of nothing. You solve problems. You solve puzzles, of course. But at the end, you create something that works. Some program, some application, something, a website. And that gives me so much satisfaction. And I think not every developer, because IT is a popular job right now. So I think not every developer wants that. But I really want to work with developers, with engineers, who have this passion for creation. To be involved and empowered. Yes. Victor, if I call you, or like if I call the trade of future that we're going to represent in the next years to come, do you think this, like, like before it was called IT, then yeah. software soft, software developer, software engineer, it becomes like broader and broader. Do you think it's going to be going towards engineering or development? Because development is really broad because like develop is basically de evolve something, evolve idea to the next stage. This is what we call development. Yeah. What do you think the job that we're going to be representing or we're representing right now will be called in 10 years? I think there is a clear trend here because I started writing code with some ugly programming languages. Uh, and you remember Assembler? <laughs> and at some point, I was pretty f proud of myself that I'm able to create an application in for iPhone that has no memory leaks. And the way you achieve it, you count every reference to to a variable. And so you have to like count. If you have five, then you have to release five. And you have to be really smart about it. That skill is useless today. At some point, Apple just released automa automatic reference count. And after that, I was like, okay, why, why did I learn all of that? Why, why was I so proud? And it keeps happening, in my opinion. And I think that's uh, going to happen even faster with, with uh, AI right now. So I think we are more and more like, I mean, when you when you create a new a website or whatever application, yeah, when you develop something, uh, you're yeah, not really enjoying the debugging time, yeah. So maybe it takes you one hour to create something, and then you debug it for two hours. You're not really enjoying that time. So nobody will be like, "Oh, I miss bad days back then when you know I had to debug for hours <laughs> till late." Uh, no, nobody will miss that. AI will do it for you. Find all the bugs and just solve it. And it's great. So I think what, what's happening more and more is that people will be able to create a MVP, a proper MVP that, you know, you need right now a team of developers to create in three months of time. People will be able to create that with AI within over a weekend. I think that is already happening. So we are mo moving... I'm having a hard time putting a label on a developer or an engineer. I like the word kind of like the idea of cre creation. Yeah, you just create something. You create an MVP. You build it or you develop it. You name it. A digi kind of a digital creator. So everyone 
will be able to be a creator. Yeah. If you think yeah. about it, if AI can do everything for you, what's left for you? It's to decide what to create. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I love that. Like, you know, this is a really good moment to wrap it up. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, you and I, we, we, we could... We could we could look back in five years and then in ten years and see how uh, how our wishes wishes and ideas uh, would come through or came through already. So we, we might be already oh. living at this time. And we were completely wrong five years ago. <laughs> yeah, guys, it was super super nice talking to Victor and having him as a guest. Uh, I'm going I'm going to post uh, tons of links that he would share with me, including his, uh, LinkedIn profile. So if you would like to reach out to Victor and basically his, cons uh, or learn more about Ask Schmidt or any other projects that he does, or he will do maybe with you, then, um, please just look at a description. If you, and if you like this, uh, podcast and it's by the way, just for, for friends and friends in Berlin and for very small community, just subscribe to, to see other people joining. So thanks, Victor. It was super nice talking to you. It was a blast, yeah. And don't forget to put into that description my YouTube channel about climbing. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Okay, take care. Cheers.